Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. You can follow us on Twitter at Thundercast underscore pod and head on over to Facebook. Give the page over there a like as well. Click the links in the description of the episode here and all episodes so you can find the Thundercast YouTube channel. You can make your way over and be a part of the big green and you can get involved with the Thunder Trust if that's something you feel like you'd be like to be a part of. We've got a busy and I do mean a busy week in martial athletics this week. Uh, there, there's some more of the weeks coming down the pipeline. This is starting to be a theme, Russ, a pretty good theme that uh, we're digging on seeing and talking about each week. It was pro day. We'll talk about that a little bit for the football guys. Um, if you missed a couple of days ago, we published our pre-spring football preview with none other than head football coach Charles Huff. That's live on the YouTube channel and, of course, all audio streaming devices or uh, platforms as well. So let's get into this bad boy. we got a lot to talk about. Let's get us a quick word from our sponsors at 304carwreck.com. If you've been hurt in a wreck, visit 304carwreck.com on the web or on Facebook. Jason and Matt are experienced injury lawyers in Huntington who practice throughout West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. They can't protect you from bad drivers, but they will make sure you're treated fairly by the insurance companies. Find them at 304carwreck.com. Uh, we have a ton of stuff to talk about, so um, some on the field and off the field stuff, which is always great to talk about. So where are we getting it kicked off? Let's start it with five things every herd fan needs to know this week. Well, I'm actually going to start it with eight things every okay. Earth fan needs to know this week. <laughs> okay. And as always, brought to you by IgniteLink, the Tri-State's premier IT management team. Number one, it's an of-the-week party. Now Brad Armbruster has uh, joined the party. He was named the Sunbelt Conference Men's Track Athlete of the Week. Yeah, uh, I saw that, and he's had a pretty good week. Oh, uh, he had a, well, obviously, week. he had a good week last week to be named SBC uh, track athlete of the week, but then goes into the, what was that? The Weems Baskin Invitational and wins the yeah. 800 meters. I know we're going to talk yeah. about that in a little bit, but it's like this streak kind of is not just one week. It's it's kind of bleeding over into the Invitational here and comes away with a win for the herd. So congratulations to Brett Armbruster. He's like I said last, I think I said this last time, he's a local kid, Cabell Midland, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, yep. um, I mean, this is a fun fact that, you know, not – it's kind of a personal note, personal like link to Brett. Uh, my oldest son and him played little league together in in Barbersville before, you know, we moved down to Florida, and that was many many years ago. So it's pretty cool to see kids that I knew from a different era. Kind of, you know, this isn't a baseball thing. This is a track and field thing, and now he's excelling in that realm too. So that's that's pretty cool for me to see. I enjoy seeing that kind of stuff. So congratulations to him. That's a pretty great way to kick off the episode. So what you're saying is you are old, old. <laughs> old yeah um no guys i know we get mistaken for being in our early 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 20s all the time but we're we're actually a little bit older than that <laughs> russ and i uh, are actually both the uh steve buscemi meme that's <laughs> hello fellow children <laughs> yeah a uh, little bit about his week and this is before that uh weems baskin invitational but uh he is now leading or was at the time in both the 800 and the 1500 to, uh, across the conference he had a uh one minute 52.07 second run in the 800 and that was again last week and three minutes 35.91 seconds in the 1500 and that was at that uh, river city spring break classic in north florida that they had so we'll talk a little bit more about his times from this week when we get in around the herd but uh Congratulations yeah. to joining an ever growing, weekly growing, it seems like, list yeah. of herd athletes. Is it just are, is it just me, or does it seem like these are coming across more than in the SBC era than the Conference USA era? Is it just me, or, or, or is it like my mind is seeing what it wants to see? I, it it could be a little bit about that, and it could be that Conference USA couldn't afford the graphics to put out that <laughs> said they're of the week. 
So we might not have ever seen them. We might have won every week and didn't know it, you know. So <laughs> uh, Judy didn't want to splurge for that uh, that one dollar graphic or or whatever. Well, just a theory. I mean, I could be wrong. Solid theory. Let's go over to number two and Marshall Athletics. I love this, by the way. Won the 2022 Community Engagement Award from United Way of the River Cities. Wow. I mean, I know that there's been a longstanding partnership with Marshall Athletics and the uh, United Way of the River Cities. So this is not like out something of new. It's not yeah, out it's of not out of nowhere. This is a longstanding, really positive relationship that goes back a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And it's just cool that after all of these years, that that relationship goes to even higher levels. It just mm -hmm. ramps up more and more and more to the point that where you – you know, you get in a, a get a, a community engagement award and it it it's it says what we all know to be true, that it's uh, when it comes to herd athletes and herd athletics, it is not just what they do on the fields, courts, and then they're done. It's like they're spending what limited free time they have. We talked about this with Coach Huff, right, a, a little yep, bit. With, their with schedules. The, what their schedules are. They're still finding that time to – engage with the community and that's really one of the things that makes marshall and huntington special on a level that other colleges and their respective cities and towns can only wish their relationships were like so super cool i'm gonna take it a step further and bring it full circle because we talked about uh nil with coach huff yeah. and we talked about the thunder trust with yeah. coach huff and what has happened uh that we've talked about before but for anybody that doesn't realize it any of these nil things that people are doing with our student athletes is tied to community service so when you do an nil thing from your business or personal or whatever you can say hey you know i would like for them to do go work for the facing hunger food bank for a day you know go over and read to the kids at the boys and girls club whatever that you've seen in social media those are tied to this NIL thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have to thank the Thunder Trust for the way that they set that up, you know, because I think we can all agree that it, it's great when we see that our athletes and the university that we love so much is giving back to the community. And that's what they're doing. And, and you know, having kids in this community and seeing kids light up when these athletes, you know, I've posted a couple of them on social media yesterday, but imagine being in school and an athlete comes in and spends some time with you and teaches you how to read and things like that. It's just great, man. Yeah. I, I, as a kid growing up where I grew up, that didn't happen. You know, we were so far removed from uh, a major college or university that those opportunities just didn't come mm -hmm. to my town, you know? Yeah. So I imagine that would be super, super cool. And, you know, and take away the fact that they're an athlete or something like that. Just just imagine like when a basketball player who's 6'10 just yeah. rolls into your classroom as a third grader yeah. and you're like, whoa, you know, that just that kind of shock and awe is cool in and of itself. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could have been like that type of little kid that had that things ha had those things happening at his school. But eh, alas but it's still yeah. cool that you have children in the community and we have friends that also live in the community and they have children that are experiencing that coolness from a herd standpoint. That's just wicked. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, I, I have some ties to some of these, uh, uh, charities, nonprofits or whatever that are, are receiving some of this, uh, uh, sweat equity or whatever mm -hmm. from these athletes. And, uh, you know, it, I love seeing that as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, great news on that. We're always going to promote things like that. The uh, stuff that our athletes are doing in the classroom. You know, we're a big advocate of getting that info out. People tell us all the time they love hearing about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're always going to promote that. But that right there is my thing of the week that I was as happy about with We've got some cool stuff, but this is all about our athletes and what they do off the courts and off the fields, like you said. Uh, number three, Kylie Maston is the new outdoor 1,500-meter record holder at Marshall. Uh, she had a time of 4 minutes, 26.2 seconds. 
Now, look, I don't have any idea how many overall records are inside that track and field record book, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems like they could just take that thing and fling it out the window because a new record or records seem to be falling every single week, man. I don't know what is going on in Huntington, West Virginia from a track and field standpoint, but man, these records are just falling by the yeah. wayside and, and you you really don't know which one's going to be next i mean i could i can't as i follow this program and, and try to you know see where we're really strong in this particular distance or we're really great in this field event i still don't know you know what to expect like okay th- we've been nipping at the heels of this record this is probably the next one to go down so it's always nice it's a nice surprise i don't know that i want to know it that intimately to where I'm expecting a record to fall. I think I just like finding out on the fly that another one has fallen. And this one is so cool. The, the next record to go, well, next, I guess not to go, but new record holder, Kylie Maston. And uh, it was cool, man. They posted a picture of her uh, fresh after the race and um, big smile. Yeah. Super happy. It was awesome. That was, that was really great moment to have captured. That was, that was pretty cool to see. Yeah. Uh, that that was um that's one of those things man you're like this is kind of what makes it special you know fresh off of breaking a record and you captured the moment that's that's really cool i'm gonna get out my prediction hat usually it's a speculation hat but i'm gonna say that uh you know as this uh spring outdoor season goes on that she will break it herself just like everyone else has been doing week after week they're breaking their own previous Mm -hmm. record we saw with you know macy majoy and all that stuff um, I, I think now, you know, once she gets that, that that's her new goal is to beat that. I mean, because that's usually when you're in these timed events, you know, you're competing against yourself as sure. we say all the time. So now she's competing against her own self, uh, for that record. And, uh, now she's got motivation to do it and do it and do it. And hopefully that leads to some medals or whatever at, and placements at, at the Sunbelt conference or better. We should have done an over under of school records to fall for track and field season. I'm before. gonna take the over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, yeah. What's the number? That's what I mean. Like what? Doesn't, what's the doesn't matter. I'm gonna yeah. take the over. <laughs> <laughs> there is no push. Here, I'm good a, for it. I'm good for it. Put every of the records is yeah. falling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number four, Micah Handlockton is heading to Brazil for the Sports Reach basketball camp, and that will be May the 18th through the 29th. Very, yeah, that, very cool. That's one of those that I didn't see coming, you know, because you really don't ever hear about stuff like that. And then all of a sudden the graphic comes across your social media timeline and you're like, huh, well, that's a pretty neat opportunity because you'd like to think seasons. Well, <laughs> for all but four teams, the season is over, you know. Uh, well, I guess there's NIT still going on or something. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, as, as far as the NCAA tournament goes, everybody's done except for four teams. And so, you know, guys are doing their own probably like uh, shoot arounds and workouts and that kind of stuff. Nothing really organized because it's not that time of the year. Mm -hmm. And to go, you know, take part in something like this for 10 ish days, you would like to think that that's going to, you know, provide Micah with a little bit of a leg up, some extra uh, workout against some stiffer competition than he would otherwise probably face at this time on the calendar for a normal NCAA athlete. So, that's just a cool opportunity, and, and it's going to open uh, his brand, his personal brand up to yep. a lot more different eyes, uh, some international eyes. And we all know, you know, that the uh, the international basketball scene has become far more popular for, you know, American players over the last pff, two decades, let's say. Yeah. Um, so it's just cool. This is a great opportunity for him. It's going to, you know, hopefully help him – Um, and his game for what it means to the herd next year also, but just personally, just a personal accomplishment and opportunity, happy for the dude. I think that's awesome. And, um, I have no reason to believe that he won't go down to Brazil and start swatting shots out of the gym. (laughs) And, you know, more eyes on him and exposure more eyes on on Marshall, you know, we're, we're going to see, uh, you know, as his brand elevates throughout the off season and into next season, that's just more people going to be checking out the Marshall brand. It's true. You know, so, uh, and that goes for all our athletes. We're not singling him out, but this specific thing, this camp he's going to is going to open up, uh, some more eyes on him. I imagine. Yeah. 
All right. So uh, this week, and the week is still going on in softball. We kind of, you know, starts over again Monday mornings. But this week, Autumn Owen became the nation's leader in home runs, and Alex Coleman became the nation's leader in stolen bases. Now, whether by the end of this day today, that will still be true that they're leading, we don't know. But this week, both of them ascended to that top spot. Yeah. And that's so freaking cool. As everybody likes to rally around the long ball because that's mm-hmm. just such a sensationalist yep. type play. And I am obviously not taking anything away from Autumn Owen because that's just so freaking cool. But look, the personally to me, how many times do I have to tell you? I'm all about the base running. I love stealing bases. I love that kind of thing. So for me, I'm a tidbit more excited for Alex Coleman because that's more in my wheelhouse. You know, power hitting was never my game, obviously. Base running was my game. So that's what I enjoy seeing. And to have that, have that particular statistic be ours as a nation's leader, man, that one really makes me feel good. I love that. Don't, don't, I can't explain it. It's just, that's what's in my wheelhouse. But both of those are tremendously awesome accomplishments and even though currently uh, Sid's not leading the country in wins and strikeouts, she's got to be like right there. So let's not just forget that we also have one of the nation's best pitchers as well. But yeah. uh, two national national leaders in big time categories is a testament to this program, is a testament to our coaching staff and a testament to our player development. I am just completely appreciative of what's going on in real from in real time at dot Hicks field. This is so great, man. Yeah. I was going to bring up Sid Nestor that uh, whatever it ends up this week, if she's first, second, third, she is right amongst the leaders in ERA strikeouts and uh, wins. And to have at various times, those five big categories held by a Marshall player. Yeah. nationally that is yeah. great that's yeah. great we're looking at 26 and 3 the game today on sunday as we record is going on right now we hope that by the time we get to uh around the herd to cover that we might know a little <laughs> bit better on um, whether or not they came out with a victory today but uh 26 and 3 uh you know we've got a little this is on social media and we'll get to it a little bit more in, uh, in around the herd, but in social media amongst the Sun Belt, you know, Louisiana is the, the big dog and has been for a long time there. And they have been talking about their RPI and, you know, I don't want to take anything away from them, but just because we have not played more than four Sun Belt games, we're four and O against the Sun Belt right now. Yeah. Uh, they are three, no, it's three and oh, isn't it? Yeah, Undefeated, was, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but but anyway, uh I think that uh we're making the noise, we're making the right kind of noise. And yeah. uh uh I think that we'll earn a lot more respect from and it's not I'm not singling out Louisiana, I'm saying they're the number one team right yeah. now. Uh in and they're the team to beat in the Sun Belt as far as it goes, amongst a lot of teams to beat. Yeah, well, let me put this in context for our fans, our listeners and viewers that have probably no clue um, how good Louisiana softball is and has been for a really long time. Uh, Marshall, you know, what's it take to win a series? Two out of three games, right? You win two of the three of the weekend series, you win the series. That's basic. Um, I saw yesterday, or maybe it was earlier today, Louisiana has just completed their 75th consecutive Winning Sun Belt series it means they yeah. haven't lost a series to a Sun Belt team in 75 series. That's a long time. Yeah. You know, you're talking about multiple seasons worth of Sun Belt conference play and have not lost two of three to any one team. That's how good they are, right? Uh, but I think my beef is, um, you know, us as G5s, mid majors, whatever the term is you want to use, mm-hmm. um, how often do we get? angry when the big dogs say well you just don't play anybody well your Mm -hmm. schedule is not strong well you don't belong well it doesn't mean you're not a good team you can only play who's on your schedule right Mm -hmm. 
And I know that we have some freedom in these other sports to schedule things on the fly. We pick up midweeks all the time. But we're also not in a geographic area that's just a softball hotbed. So you play yeah. who's close. If you're picking up a game, you're going to Moorhead or you're going to, you know, somewhere close, right? Yeah. That makes sense. So just because your RPI isn't through the roof doesn't mean you're not a good team. I mean, yeah. look, we're, we're national leaders in all these big categories, and you still have to go out and execute, and you still have to play. So I think my beef with some of these other schools that are trying to downplay what we are is, like, you're using the argument against us that big that schools are using use against you. us to yeah. keep us – yeah, to keep us out. So you can't have it both ways. And, and also, I don't think you'll catch me going, you know, Team X from the Sun Belt isn't that great. Uh, yeah, I, th I think like they're good. They're winning. Why can't we yeah. just be good? We can both be yeah. good. You know? Well, and and we have made it a point, and a lot of people in the Sun Belt have too, to promote each other. You know, yeah. and and we uh, we all want the Sun Belt Conference. I, I mean, how often do we have to talk about it each week about how happy we are to be in the Sun Belt Conference instead of being in Conference USA? Yeah, and and yeah. it seems like we are having explosive growth by being in this, it's this breath of fresh air and this competition that we're going up against now is it's just, it feels like we're growing in everything. Yeah. And I, I'm so happy to be there. So I'm not going to dog somebody else by saying, yeah, they have a good record, but I'm going to say they have a good record. And when we play them, you know, it ought yeah. to be a really good game. Right. You better bring your A game because it's going to yeah. be a tough matchup. I just don't get that mentality either. And I don't, you know, they can do whatever they want. People can do whatever they want. I don't care. I'm not fan police. Don't give crap. Sure. But I'm not going to get caught up in that. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It just, yeah. it just kind of rubs me the wrong way when you, you use arguments against us that people use against you. Like Louisiana ought to be saying that these big, like Oklahoma and stuff like that, they don't play the Louisiana's of the world. And I know that Louisiana plays some, some big name teams. I'm not taking that away from them. You can tell by their strength of schedule, Yeah, but you know what I mean? The elite of the elite are wanting to hold down the Louisiana's of the world. Sure. So the Louisiana's shouldn't want to hold down or downplay the yeah. other people in the Sunbelt conference, yeah. because if they don't win the conference championship every single year, it does not really matter if they've won 75 series in a row when it comes tournament time. Now they may be, if we go look at the record books, they might be 18 years in a row. They won it. Don't know, you yeah. know? Um, but every single year, there is a chance that anyone in this conference can win on any given day. Yeah. And we, and that's we, the outlook that every coach, I know that the coaches aren't, aren't going, Hey, go ahead and mark down a win against the rest of these Sunbelt teams because we won 75 in a row. That's, yeah. that's the big deal. Yeah. So whatever, you take the field, you win the games, you keep winning. At some point, it's not going to matter. When your freaking record is just ballooned in the left-hand column, you're going to be like, geez, <laughs> RPI, be da whatever data point you want to try to pick and choose to downplay it, it's not going to work because you'll be, you know, let's just say 35 and 3. Like, yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to ignore that. You still got to go out and play and win every game and perform every game. So whatever. It is what it is. Other people can argue about stupid stuff like that. Yeah, we're not going <laughs> to. I, ju I just prefer to focus on our team and, and you know, like I said, I'm not calling out any of, any of our followers or anything. Somebody got in our DMs about it, and I was like, I just prefer to, you know, yeah, we're report on our away. team and let the chips fall where they may. If we lose, bummer. If we win, great. That's it. I'm not going to get in petty arguments over it. Now, from my standpoint, not yours because I haven't mentioned this to you at all, but from my standpoint, I would tell our fans that um, promoting our brand is great. Believing in your team is great. But you also need to look at the other stuff, too. It would come at, uh, let's say that you're looking at uh, the Mac era Marshall football, and then all of a sudden someone comes up into the Mac and they were – six and one in their first seven games and they start promoting just how daggone good they are. Mm -hmm. I think Marshall fans would tell that team, slow down. Why don't yeah. you wait until you've played us? And why don't you, you know, do it consistently year after year and then we'll talk. And so I can see where Louisiana is coming from on that as well. And our fans don't need to anoint us just yet because we just started Sunbelt conference play. 
So let's uh let's let's wait. I'm I'm a hundred percent bullish on this team. Uh I I think we are one of the most dangerous teams in softball in the country. And uh I just you know where I'm getting. You I you do just you I just do. you just don't don't hit the gas so hard right now because we'll have a lot more to back up when we win. I don't know, 85% of our conference games or something like that. I get what you're saying. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's ways you can go about it. But to those points, you're saying, well, let's wait and let's see. I don't want to wait because they're winning now and they're fun now and they deserve to get all the hype they get now and they deserve all the shine that we can throw at them. Because no, no, I'm talking about softball. Some of the things that have, I'm not softball, Sunbelt. Some of the things that have been said is like, hey, you know, we're – we're leading in the Sun Belt because we have an undefeated record at the right. time we were one no. You, you know, yeah, but you know how people do. They pick the data point and they're like, nobody will read this article. This is the headline. Well, I right? know, but I'm I'm saying, you know, that's that's not a fight you're gonna win <laughs> if you're if you're thumping your chest about the, the Sun Belt when you're one and oh in the Sun yeah, Belt. Yeah, I get what you you're know. saying, but that's that's so, just people trying to do something, you know, to like there are folks out there that just say stuff to try to get a rise out of people, you know. Sure. Sure. So whatever, whatever, let people do what they want. But look, I'm going to tell you this because people, if they're watching this on YouTube while we're talking, they're going to see me looking down at my phone a lot. And that's because I'm following the current softball. softball game right now. I'm following the live, uh, the live stats as the game's going on because I want to see if it busts loose. We're kind of in a tight one right now. Uh, just a quick update through four. It's in the bottom of the fourth right now. Marshall's up one to nothing still. So they're in a little bit of a tight one. They don't really have anything going at this point, but the inning just started. No on, no out. But anyway, uh, let's Good press deal. on. Yeah, number six, Kate Roll has been hired as the new director of recruiting operations for football. She uh, put a social media post out there and uh, said that uh, she couldn't believe as a 22-year-old female that uh, something that, she hit this goal already, and we just want to praise her for that and welcome her on. Yeah, welcome to the herd. I saw that she's a Michigan State alum, I think. It said MSU. I'm just going to say it's Michigan State. Could be Mississippi State. Could be Moorhead State. I don't know. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Michigan State because I'm just going to say she likes to wear green, and that's why she's here at Marshall now. So let's just let's just go with that. But, no, congratulations uh, and welcome to the herd. Uh, we're lo looking forward to um, – all you can do to bring the herd program upward and onward, as we like to say here on the Thundercast. Yeah. Number seven, this is breaking, breaking news. Uh, just about an hour ago, it got posted on Herd Zone. Kevin Schenk has been named as the women's soccer assistant coach. I saw that, and I was wondering if you were going to catch that. So I jotted down a note or two. Uh, Kevin Shank, uh, hired as assistant coach, comes over from Indiana University, a team in soccer uh, circles, at least as far as Marshall goes, that we seem to not be able to get away from. Uh, but he was, uh, he's been at Indiana University for the last couple of years, working primarily with their goalkeepers. Uh, in the article, the release said that uh, he will work with all facets of the herd program, including the goalkeepers. So um, that's cool. We were wondering what this team was going to do. We know they hit the portal pretty hard, brought, brought in a couple of weapons, and um, now we're at making some additions to the coaching staff. Let's hope that uh, the women's program takes a step forward this year. I mean, it's it's unfair. It's completely unfair to say, you know, uh, following the success of the men's program because, dang, no other program really at Marshall, period, is – on a, on as white hot as the men's soccer program, but um, it would be pretty cool to have a have a two headed monster there from a uh, soccer program standpoint with both men's and women's there at Marshall because you know there's a lot of excitement around it. So hopefully uh, that translates to some su some successes for the women this year too. Yeah, um, I I just I'm I'm excited. They've got some spring games coming up. We're going to talk about it and around the herd and everything. And I'm excited that we've taken someone that specializes in goalkeeping. He said goalkeeping and outfield players and stuff like that. But I have to imagine that Indiana, uh, because it's a Big Ten program, has you know their coaches and everything. I don't imagine that they get somebody that well. He's an average coach or whatever. Said that yeah. he had some high school coaching, uh, club ODP that sort of thing experience. Then he went to Indiana's, worked 
goalkeepers and stuff like that. So I'm excited to see what he brings here. It's just one more level of getting somebody from a bigger program uh, with a lot of resources. That yeah, sort of I, w- I was going to say it's not no, it's not really about a bigger program more so than a historically strong soccer program. You yeah, know? So, yeah, that's what I mean in soccer. Yeah, not bigger, not bigger in school, but the the soccer programs at Indiana and it being a Big Ten program, the resources that they put sure. into such a program, it just it makes me excited to see you know what he can bring in being an assistant coach here, the knowledge the experience that sort yeah. of thing. It, I mean, it can only help, right? If you're yeah. working with Indiana's, your focus, your sole focus, I won't say it's sole focus. I don't know if it was or not, but your primary focus has been goalkeeping and at Indiana. Well, that is something that to my knowledge, we haven't had someone that has uh, had such a narrow um, line of coaching for the last couple of years, but his role here, obviously, like I said, will be expanded, but still you get the the wealth of knowledge for, is there a more vital <laughs> like uh, position on a soccer field at any given time than somebody that keeps goals out of the net? I mean, I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty important. So I'm glad to have a guy here that can, you know, hopefully take ours up a couple of notches and, and yeah. maybe put a few more clean sheets on the board. And I've got some info for you from Kate Roll. She was at Michigan State, so yeah, you guessed nailed correctly. It. Yeah, nailed it. Um, the eighth thing that we have this week that will be the end of them, we had Pro Day on Wednesday here at Marshall, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, Pro Day was cool, man. I've, if you uh, watched the first episode of Inside the Thunder with Kaden Labor, we talked about that, and he, I asked him what was next for him, and he said Pro Day, you know, and um, that happened a couple days ago. Uh, you know, 14 guys, I think it was, they 14. said participated, yep. which, okay, let me stop right there and talk about this. I remember several years ago, it might it was probably more than several years ago, really. We used to open our pro days up even before maybe they called it pro day, uh, like officially, we used to open it up for like a lot of regional players. And I remember distinctly, there were guys flying in from, you know, all over the place to work out at Marshall and not that I'm trying to be stingy or anything, but I'm glad we don't do that now because that yeah. takes eyes off of our guys. And that's yeah. the goal. The goal is to put our guys at the next level if they have the skill set to get there. And we know so much that it's about not just being able to perform, but the situation you get put in, right? Player mm-hmm. A might get put on team B and it doesn't work out. But if player A got put on team C, hell, he could be a – you know, one of those, oh, my God, I can't believe this guy was a late-round draft pick. He's a Hall of Famer. So it's mm-hmm. it's very much about the right situation. So to just have our guys be the ones focused on is pretty cool. I, I, I can appreciate that, and I like that. Uh, I'm not trying to be stingy, but I want our guys to have every opportunity they can get. So do you got a list of the 14 that, that uh, I mean, we know some of them, but do you have a list of all of them? I do. Uh, Zach Apio, uh, long snapper, Damian Barber, defensive line, Abraham Boplan, linebacker, Isaiah Carpenter, defensive line, Henry Columbia, quarterback, Stephen Gilmore, cornerback, Charlie Gray, linebacker, Jacob Kirkendall, tight end, Kalen Labron, running back, Stacy Marshall, Jr., tight end, Isaiah Norman, safety, Cedric Palant, uh, offensive line, Kendrick Sartor, offensive line, and Anthony Watts, defensive line. That's the 14. Okay, so it was a, it was, it was a kind of all over the place. A couple D linemen, a couple offensive linemen, and the and the who's who that we knew were going to be there, Labor and Gilmore, Bo Plan, um, Isaiah Norman. Glad to see him, you know, back to what we assume was full strength because when that guy's full strength, he's, he's something special. Um, cool, man. I, I did see some 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 of the stats. I guess what I should have done really is gone and gone to the combine results and saw how these guys ranked. But sometimes you don't need to do that. The numbers just tell you. And and I'm going to steal some. I know you've got these stats here, but I'm going to steal like the forty. Everybody goes to the forty. Mm-hmm. Gilmore ran a four four and Labron and Isaiah Norman right behind him at a four five. That's that's moving. You're moving. Well, well. Let me correct there on the four or five. It was mm-hmm. actually uh they said the four or five range. It was a four four or five, which is well different. Yeah, it's, but it but it's totally different than a four or five. A four that's four a huge five difference is what uh what Labern actually ran there. 
Well, then that's what it should have been. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. But so still, those numbers, you're scooting, right? And mm-hmm. it doesn't matter where you rank necessarily in the overall scheme of things because some guys are just burners. But you're talking about a guy in particular like Kalen, 300-plus carries on the year. You know, the yardage was there. The touchdowns were there. The uh, the um, the ability to stay healthy and or play hurt was there. And to still come out after a relatively short turnaround, what was it, like 90 days or something to get healed up, to get, um, you know, in training mode, and then to get in the best peak performance condition that you can get for pro day to come out and and uh, perform in not just the 40, but he busted out a 38 and a half inch vertical jump and the broad jump was 10 five, which I think I saw somewhere. This could be wrong. Would have ranked like fourth of running backs at the combine. I could be wrong about that, but it was up there. Well, here, here's actually what he's with athlete innovations down mm-hmm. in Tampa mm-hmm. training. And they put this out and here was what his numbers are. And it says combine comparison. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, they have him down as a 4.44 in the 40-yard dash, and that would be sixth in the combine. Uh, these are all uh, the things that he would have been top 10 in. No, wait. Is uh, this just running back only or overall? Running, running or back, it... No, running back okay. only. Yeah. Um, 10-5 broad, broad jump, they have him as number three okay. in the running backs in the combine comparison. 38 and a half – or 38-5 vertical three in the combine uh 23 on the bench press and that's second in the combine and number one overall in the cone drill 6.92 seconds yeah so um extremely good measurables they're not just going with his stats that he had last year these measurables are a, what a lot of these uh, teams look at. It's it's looking really good for Mr. Labron as far as how he stacks up against all these guys. And you know what the thing is, is um, if he gets drafted, which wouldn't surprise me, right? No matter where he gets drafted, folks are going to be like, oh, he was ripped. You know, he should have been way higher. But again, it's not necessarily about where you go because mm-hmm. you don't have to look any further than heard running backs than Ahmad Bradshaw. Dude was drafted mm-hmm. like fifth from the end of the draft and yeah. turns into be a two-time Super Bowl winning running back that had like a, what, 10-year career, it seemed like. Yeah. So don't get hung up on where in the draft you go, or even if you get drafted, because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's it would it matters in the fact that it's a lifelong dream that you probably have and you want to hear it, you want to get that phone call. Hey, we're drafting you. Yeah. But outside of that, it's about the scenario where you land and how big of an impact you can. What's the running back room look like? Or does the cornerback room look like? Can I get a roster spot? And if you can get the roster spot, then you can begin to make some make some waves. One injury to a starter away from having an NFL career that, yeah. you know, I mean, you see it happen all the time. And uh, today's modern game, uh, it's not like when the 80s, I would say, or even the, the early part of the 90s, uh, or all through the 90s, where there was one back yeah. for each team that they gave all the carries to, or 95% of the carries. Now, you know, it's it's not unheard of to have four running backs that you rotate to keep people fresh and, you know, a specific third down back and a specific receiving back and different packages. And if you're mm-hmm. up late in the game or if you're above, it's just a totally different game now. And you don't see those those dominant running backs of, hey, I'm going to have 27 touchdowns because I had uh, 50 carries a game. You just don't see him as much anymore. Yeah, it's a different game. It's a, it's a yeah. passing league. It's now. a passing league, yeah. But what you can talk about, from at least from Laburn's standpoint, is he checks a lot of those boxes for you. He can get the mm-hmm. tough yard. He can be the runaway runner. You know, He's a speed guy and a little bit of a power guy, somewhat of a finesse guy too. Um, I guess if you have to put a knock on the game, it's like he's not a huge weapon catching passes out of the backfield. He can do it. But, you know, like if you put he and Ali together, well, it's obvious that Ali, that's a big part of Ali's game, but it's not a big part of Kalen's game. But he still brings so many facets in his uh, arsenal. There's so many weapons in his arsenal. Somebody's going to take uh, – may use a draft pick on him, which I hope they do. I hope he gets to hear his name called get that phone call. But he's going to get a shot. 
He is yeah. going to get a shot. You just don't not get a shot doing uh, putting up the numbers that you put up throughout the season, knowing that you were the primary weapon that people had to stop in order to beat the herd early in the year, and they couldn't, you know. And then you come out in pro day and put up numbers like this that rank in top 10 in all these different categories if he were at the combine. So we've he's got a real opportunity, and I'm really happy for him because he's a great dude. He's a great dude, yeah. man. What a great, what a great young man because – Yesterday, and I can say young man because I'm in my mid 40s, <laughs> but, but uh, uh, he was at the softball game yesterday. Uh, I was able to go to the first game. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but um, I had my kids there and he took a photo with them and it mm-hmm. meant the world to them. And uh, he sat with, uh, with the fans, you know, and talked to them and different ones. And after the, the first game between the games, he was making his way down and some people stopped him and talked to him and he he sat and talked to every one of them for as long as they wanted to talk and took photos and and everyone knew him he's just such a great man and we are lucky that we got him to come here i know that he feels lucky that he got to come here Mm -hmm. but we are equally lucky if not more lucky to have experienced having this this guy in our community yeah, he spoke about that. He did. Yeah. When when I when I talked to him on Inside the Thunder, he was I asked him what made Marshall special and he said that they just accepted me. Like, yeah. Right away. You know, so um I wish him all the luck. We didn't even talk about the other guys. Like uh Steph- Stephen Gilmore had a great showing out there, yeah. really made a name for himself. Uh, you know, he's in so many of these NFL circles, it's always going to be a Stephen Gilmore. Oh, that's Stephon Gilmore's younger brother. And I think We've talked about so many times at this point, if you don't think Stephen Gilmore has made his own name, then I think you're just doing him an injustice because he's a great corner and that's nothing against Stefan. Right. But you don't want to be the next Stefan Gilmore. You want to be the first Stephen Gilmore. And he's done that. And these some of these numbers talk about that. His career at Marshall has done that. I think he's another guy that could end up being a late round draft pick because we hey we just talked about this being a pass happy league, and you really can't have enough good cover corners. You can't have a good uh, enough good edge rushers. Obviously, first and foremost. But uh, if you don't have that, you need guys that can cover. And and Stephen can cover, and he can go up and get the ball. So he's got a lot in his arsenal as well to make some noise. I like his chances. I think he could be a late round guy. Uh, in the right situation, he could stick and be a multi-year player. And at that point, it's not hurting him to say, well, you know, nobody had really thought Stefan was going to be what he turned into be. So then maybe that's where being the younger brother gives you that benefit of the doubt kind of thing. Yeah. But as far as his performance and his numbers and what he's done, he's his own guy right now, and I'm pumped for him too. Isaiah Norman had a really good showing as well. He came in narrowly second behind some of these leaders we've been talking about, and he led in the uh, 20-yard shuttle at uh, 4.16 seconds, uh, showing a lot of speed. You know, he was right there with uh, Kalen Labron in uh, in their 40. Uh, He was right underneath uh, uh, Labron in the cone drill. And uh, so you're seeing quickness, explosiveness, and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. That's going to help and go a long way. I mean, we we feel like Nazi Johnson's pro day and the the unbelievable uh, measuring sticks that that he hit in that probably vaulted him up people's draft boards, you know. And uh, these players putting on the performances that they did is going to put them right there. Yeah, and well, you have to take into account as well, just like Nas did. He goes in, and you have to go and probably play special teams and pay your dues and hope that yeah. you make enough plays when the opportunity's right to continue to stick on the fifty-three man roster. Yeah, and he did that. You know, he yeah. made enough plays, and then practice. You don't. We don't see what happens at practice, right? So you have to come to work every day and perform in practice because you know the NFL is pretty cutthroat. So they're like, all right, you're not hacking it. There's two hundred other guys that I can call that can come in here and do what you're doing. So you're not doing it good enough. You're out. Right. Uh, so when you look at guys like Bo plan, who was, he's got the build, he's got the physique, it's the physique you like, and all those different measurables. He had the great statistics at Marshall. He comes in you say, okay, can he go be an impact guy for an NFL team on special teams? Because most likely that's where you're going to have to start out and show something. And you look at that and you go, yeah, I think so. Because he's a high motor guy. He's got a nose for the ball. He always has had a nose for the ball. And then if he gets a crack at linebacker, 
who knows? It just takes one play to go, all right, he's our guy. Yeah. And, and there's so many more. Man, we could talk about all these guys. The last guy that I want to give some shine to is uh, Cedrice Palant because he was one of the most under-the-radar offensive linemen in college football all year long. Uh, he just came to work. And we, we spent so much time talking about what Laburn did. Well, he's the first guy to tell you – if it's all my offensive line. If they don't do the work, then yeah. I can't do what I do. And, you know, when we were talking, when I was talking to him, he mentioned, you know, Trent Holler and 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 uh, Logan Osborne by name. Uh, but, of course, Cedric, Kendrick Sartor, both of those guys, huge in the production line for what Kalen was able to do. And both of those had really strong showings at Pro Day, too. So I really like Cedric to be one of those guys that also kind of st- – Dick's in there, and and if given an opportunity to get a rep or two uh, at a mini camp or uh, a couple of mini camps or a rookie camp, I think he could raise some eyebrows and be able to stick. He made the most of his one year in Huntington, just like uh, Labron did. So I'm excited for a lot of these guys. I really am, and I, I get I get excited every year around this time, and I hope for the best. And and this year, I really think we've got a few guys that can stick. So let's see what happens, man. I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, and uh, that brings an end to our eight this week, eight things uh, every herd fan needs to know this week is always brought to you by Ignite Link. And before we go and take it around the herd, I just yep. want to bring down the chalkboard. Oh, okay. Do a 30-second uh, to two-minute talk about this. Show everyone the clue, clue number five. And just like to remind everyone to send in their guesses to what this is via dm if you would we're going to have this out on uh, social media after the uh, episode airs but uh, a reminder each individual clue is not they're not all giving you the same clue to where if you get this clue right you get the overall trivia kind of deal you don't get it uh, the mystery you don't get that yeah. right Remember, guys, it's a riddle. These are clues to the riddle. And each clue are, is not the riddle. <laughs> there are uh, just about every single board that we put up is going to have multiple clues on there. So uh, clue one, two, three, four, five, every single one that we put out so far has had multiple clues. So if you're only getting one thing from these boards, you might want to look at them a little bit tougher. That's right. And uh, we will have this... Uh, there are seven, seven different boards, seven clues. And after that, on the eighth week, we will announce what this mystery is all about. And it's an announcement that we are making about the Thundercast. There you go. I'm still following softball. <laughs> sure. <laughs> all right, let's take this around the herd. Let's do it. All right, so we are going to start off with track and field. And they had a split squad kind of deal most of the team went to the weems baskin invitational and then uh two i think of our athletes went to the went to the raleigh relays so the weems baskin invitational was brett armbruster winning the 800 invite as you mentioned and his time was 152.09 and where does that track with him on the other? Do you remember? Was that better? I don't remember. We'll have to no. look that up. I'll look it up in a minute. Uh, we also had uh, second place finishes for um, Rebecca Merritt uh, in the discus uh, and the women's 4x400 team. They had uh, Micah Elaine, Astoria Beckett, Nia Mitchell, and Marley Porter, and they had their season best three minutes, 45.33 seconds. All right, and then we go over to the Raleigh Relays, and that is where um, Kylie Maston uh, set that uh, personal record. School record, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. School record. But I just have a question for you. Was it also her personal record? Probably. Maybe. Hell, who knows? She might. (laughs) No, it doesn't. She could have set a a lower time in high school. 
Could have been, but it's highly unlikely. Yeah, I'm just saying. It's possible. All right. So uh, I couldn't find the article. It was on the same article. It was just you had to click yeah, game yeah. two, and it's over a different thing. So uh, <laughs> she set that, as we said, with a uh, four minute, 26.2 seconds. And uh, it also does say here in the article that that was her personal best. There you go. Uh, but. Uh, Marianne Adebayo uh, had a victory in the uh, hammer throw. And let's see, Kylie Maston and Sydney Smith set personal uh, bests as well. Uh, we talked about Kylie, but uh, let's see here. Marianne Adebayo was first. Rebecca Merritt was second in this hammer throw. Josie Moore was third in the hammer throw. Mm -hmm. And Lillian Ross was fourth in the hammer throw. I was wondering if they were four. able to finish that out. I saw the graphic that we were one through four, but I, I don't, I didn't know if that was like after day one kind of thing. Yeah. You know what top, I mean? Top four. They won all four of those. That's I freaking think, cool. man. I think that is really, really cool. Hammer throw school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's but anyway, really good showing by everybody. Uh, I've got the time here for Sydney Smith and her uh, 5K. Uh, her personal best was uh, 17 minutes, 42.01 seconds. So uh, great couple of days there at those two events. Yeah, it was. I think it was, again, I, you know, I read these articles and I try to go off memory, which is a dangerous thing to do, and I shouldn't do that. But I think I just saw, like, we had 10 or something like that, like, places you know first yeah. second or third place and then a bunch of like you mentioned personal records and 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 of course uh kylie Masson set the school record and arm brewster won the 800 so it, it was a pretty good showing you know what's next on the agenda we're going to talk uh tennis and they beat georgia state four to nothing and uh basically they just unfinished the rest of the matches mm -hmm. when they won their fourth uh to you know they won uh, and then we'll get to those results, but they have coming up today. They're uh, playing right now down at Troy, and then they play at Texas State on Friday and at Louisiana on Sunday. Cool. Yeah, they're off and running, man. It seems like tennis is doing really well after yeah, the little get setback a, get a great against, stride. Uh, against uh, Old Dominion, of course, which is the top 20 program, or at the time was a top 20 program. They may be a little higher or low now. Who knows? But Hurts doing some doing some work around the Sun Belt circuit in tennis. Um, so I hope I haven't seen an update today since we've been recording because of course I'm following along with Softball Live and um, I don't know where they're sitting right now in this match against Troy, but I don't know. Let's see if they can keep her rolling. Doing really well, man. I'm 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 pleasantly surprised. I hadn't I had no expectation really coming into tennis anyway. And to see that they, you know, they're exceeding my non-existent expectation is, <laughs> it's cool, man. Cause it seems like every time they don't tweet very often, they don't put much out there unless it's like match day and, and results. But it seems like every single one is like four and oh, Marshall wins again, you know, three and one Marshall wins again. So how do you get tired of seeing that? I mean, it's. I never get tired of seeing uh, Marshall do anything well. I don't care, you know, if it's Parcheesi. If they're playing it, I want to see them do well. <laughs> uh, I just want to highlight a little bit about here, and this was uh, the article before they were going in um, to this Georgia State game. So Johanna Strom uh, picked up another one, but – she is 11 and one now 12 and one during the spring season in singles and is at nine and three at number one doubles with partner Emma Vander Hayden. Um, so improving on those, I mean, she just really, really killing it. Um, doubles pairing of, uh, Reiki Gillar and, uh, Gabriel Clairot, uh, have an eight and two record in doubles and Dora Teja Joksovich has an eight and four singles record this spring yeah. so this spring they're all picking up they're doing well uh like you said they had that one little setback at number 21 20 i thought they were 20 but who cares 2021 yeah. same deal yeah. so, somewhere there um uh, odu and other than that been killing it yeah all right uh men's soccer they uh started that uh college spring league yesterday and uh i had a friend 
mutual friend of ours that was there. And this was while I was at the volleyball game. Mm -hmm. uh, it was giving me an update. They started out uh, up two to nothing. And then in the second half, it got tied back up by Xavier. And then we went on to win four to two. And that was yesterday at the vet here in Huntington. And they continue this college spring league next uh, on Saturday. They are heading to Ohio State. Yeah, I think they – didn't they play a couple of exhibition games also before the spring league started? And They did, and we didn't have any real info that was put on Herd Zone to where yeah. we had info on it. And uh, from what I have gathered, they didn't start the normal starters. It was just, uh, you know, getting everyone together to play in a kind of exhibition. Who cares about what the score is, work on this and that. They truly, truly, truly want to win this college spring league like they did last year. Sure. They, uh, they have their starters out there and the positions they're going to be starting in. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is a more true look, I would say, of what, uh, what it's going to look like. This yeah. It, this, the spring league to me seems like, um, game speed scrimmages, you know, let's yeah. put it that way because yeah. the, you know, they're, you're trying to work on, um, kind of that quiet communication amongst team amongst the mm -hmm. team. So putting up four goals, that's going to win you a lot of matches, a lot of matches. And I really don't care if they get, allow two. You know, yeah. so in, in a, in a sport that's dominated by a one O victory, four is going to win a ton of matches. And, um, it just goes, this is a one game sample, one game sample. But if this is what we're going to do again, then it's going to be exciting soccer in Huntington. Mm -hmm. And the vet's going to be packed again because for all the folks that love soccer and even those kind of fence sitting fans that are like, well, I'm trying to get behind it and I don't know much about it, whatever. If you're putting up points, that's going to be exciting. That's going to keep the crowd engaged and that's going to bring more butts to the seats. So four goals is a great way to start a campaign at home for 2023. I think you've, uh, you know, drawn in some extra casual fans. I don't know how many people were there, but if they look up and start seeing the scoreboards that look like that, they're going to make their way over to the vet for a game or two, or maybe buy season tickets or, or whatever. But, um, excellent start. I hope they win the spring league too, man. That, that, that's a nice little thing to be able to, you know, pin to your hat. That's, that's, a, that's a cool one. Uh, women's soccer, uh, they're kicking off, uh, their spring. The, again, they've had a couple of exhibitions as well, but they are playing at Kentucky today and then Radford next Sunday. Did we ever uh, find the lost score? <laughs> nope. That's going to nope. be a running joke forever. I think that's what I'm here. saying. They, they were exhibitions and everything, <laughs> but, uh, it's kind of the same way because they yeah. were exhibitions that they're just, wasn't much in the way of coverage on it. Uh, golf, this is men's and women's. They're playing in the golf week any given Tuesday intercollegiate. Now, KD, I want you to guess what day they will be playing <laughs> this uh, golf tournament. But it could be any one, any given Tuesday. So is it this one? <laughs> well, they're playing this week coming up. Oh, so, what so Tuesday. Wrong. Monday through Wednesday. <laughs> but also um, on Tuesday. <laughs> they are they are playing on Tuesday, but this <laughs> golf week, any given Tuesday, will be played Monday through Wednesday. Uh, Sponsored and, by Conference USA. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I don't know why they came up with that, but uh, <laughs> that is, uh, that's what they're having. Uh, we will have info on that. You know, we'll be tweeting out the results yeah. as we get them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Volleyball, they uh, had their spring opener yesterday, and I was able to go and take the, the kids to that as well. They beat Fairmont State at home four to one. Got to bust out the brand new floor. Got to look really the, good. Really yeah, good. it does look really good. And uh, don't apparently you didn't see this. This was one of those came across the timeline right before. You know, we hit the record button, but the herd volleyball account tweeted out that the herd just got bigger. So I'm assuming they picked up some sort of there's some recruiting news flying out there. They didn't say who I didn't you know, I didn't have time to look. I don't even know if whoever even if that's what it is. But usually if that's what it is, that's what it means. So we'll keep an eye out for that. We'll see uh, who may or may not have pledged their allegiance to the herd to come play volleyball. But um, I'm telling you, man, I think. Um, I think we got the right coach in place. Um, 
Yeah. You know, Ari wants to be here. Jake wants to be here. You know, Jake's not a coach, but it's Ari's husband. Sure. They they want to be here and um it, it, they have to build a program and she's doing that. You know, it's not like I know some of our listeners and and folks, you know, they don't they don't ever want to hear us talk say the say the words Western Kentucky. But that peer school, they're a peer school whether you want to call them that or not. They are a volleyball dynasty. You know, you're talking about a perennial top 25 team for like the last two decades. They're great. So, you know, Ari didn't walk into that type of situation. We have to build that. And and we're, we're I think, taking those steps to do that. Now, will we ever be a dynasty? Who knows? But can we win the Sun Belt a few years down the road or maybe even this year? Damn right we can. And uh, I just like knowing that, you know, Christian Spears is – commented on being committed to Ari and, and what she's doing here. And we see with the new floor, they're putting tools yeah. in place for, to give her all the tools and things she needs to be successful here. And I love it. So this is another program you want to get behind. Um, and if you go all in right with the season tickets, you're going to have tickets to volleyball and it it's going to be really easy for you to go check them out. So do that, do that. And I tell you, this uh, strikes me as one of those uh, similar to softball kind of deals to where the the athletes are like a family and it's an entertaining time and really good time to take the family of your yeah. own to watch yeah. this. And uh, my kids had a blast. Uh, my son recently, like several days ago, turned five mm-hmm. and he was just watching every single thing. Usually a five-year-old, it's hard to keep their attention and everything. And he was watching the soft, I mean, the volleyball going back and forth and uh, the chance that the, the ladies were doing and, you know, the celebrations and everything. It's fun for the whole family. Sure is. All right. So we are going to go over to our diamond sports and we're going to start off with baseball and last week we recorded on Saturday night, so we mm-hmm. didn't have Sunday's uh, uh, info. They ended up beating App State 7-5 to five on Sunday in the final game of that series, and that gave them their first ever Sun Belt Series win. Um, and that was their first Sun Belt Series, is that correct? It's our first, yes, it was our first Series. series. So they started off with a victory in their first ever Sunbelt Conference game and their first ever Sunbelt Conference series. They ended up winning that as well. So I think that's something that you should be proud of right now. Well, and it's it's App State. So take that into account. That's a team you always want to win. Marshall just loves to play and beat App State. It doesn't matter what it is. Parcheesi, like you would say, they would enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, historically pretty strong program. You yep. know, those Carolina teams are pretty good. So what's what's more to say? I mean, you, you gotta you gotta start checking these boxes, right? You gotta get the first wins, you gotta get the first there's a lot of firsts that are gonna come along. And I don't know that more fans or any fans would be happier to beat another team other than App State to get those checks in the boxes. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool, man. It's it, you know, I think what we're gonna talk about here in a minute, you know, we previewed <laughs> Uh, this series coming up that's going on now against Old Dominion and how tough that was going to be. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to get those first boxes checked against App State. So, you know, you could kind of not worry about that kind of stuff, not have to sit here and go, oh, God, are we going to go 0 and 6 and, mm-hmm. you know, some belt play to start because that would not be ideal. But it didn't happen. And right. the only thing that sucks, the only thing that sucks is that it happened at Gomart Park and it didn't yeah. happen, you know, it's like the, of course, we know we're not going to have our stadium until next year, but that's the only thing that sucks. Other than that, two thumbs up. Yeah, we uh, picked up that game in Cincinnati on Tuesday. I just happened to be up there. That was mm-hmm. my son's birthday and it was spring break. And we were up there to go to the zoo and the aquarium as part of our little trip. And I did not get to go to the game. I spent it with my family there, of course. But uh, we beat Cincinnati at Cincinnati eight to four. And uh, that helped us along the way. I think that that's a a good feather in your cap victory. uh, Anytime you can play Cincinnati. Um, We went to this series that you're talking about, uh, Old Dominion, you know, and those guys just absolutely blister the ball. They've been putting up up some terrific 
numbers this year on the offensive side. And we went down there and that day that we were uh, playing them on Friday for the, the series opener, we just happened to be in a little group chat, Sunbelt group chat. And we were talking with uh, our uh, cohorts over on the old dominion side, the ODU monarchists, they have Mm -hmm. a, a good podcast and we were telling them, Hey, we, we really hope to put in a good showing because you guys hammer the ball. And they said, do you still have that pitcher that pitched so well against us last year? Uh, and said, can't remember his name. They gave me the game. I looked it up. It was Patrick Copen. I said, yeah. And he's on the bump tonight. Yeah. Well, we ended up taking this offensive juggernaut of old dominion and beating them six to one on the back of Mr. Copen. Uh, I told him that he's been having a lot of strikeouts and that sort of thing. That's what he did. He struck them out quite a bit. And they came out with a six to one victory on the road at Old Dominion. And we were pretty pumped about that. Yeah, I think you can. First of all, this is a Patrick Copen appreciation post yeah. right now uh, because he comes out and has a career night against Old Dominion. I think if innings pitched and strikeouts, or he yeah. at least tied or set a new career high in strikeouts. He tied it. I think, it had, I think what do you have, 11? Yeah, he tied what it. An, yeah. What an effort. I mean, these guys just take the ball out of the yard with relative ease. And, of course, yeah. now we saw that in the game, too. The next game they busted out 21 runs. and Yeah. A couple of, you know, one guy eight, had three home eight, runs. Eight home runs, and Jack Tyser had three of them. But so. that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. You, that just proves – how dominant of an effort that Patrick Copen put out on yeah. Friday night in the opener of the series. So there, this, this kid's a gem. I mean, he is a gem. Something and, to build on. Uh, hell yeah. It's something to build on. Yeah. So, you know, you got to know that uh, Greg Beals and, and the coaching staff are just through them over the moon with what they're getting out of, of uh, Copen this season. Cause phew, he has just performed game in and game out. And, and, this this one in Norfolk, I bet those fans didn't see that coming either. Yeah. You know, they were expecting, oh, this is Marshall. They don't even have a stadium. We're going to just beat the brakes off of them. This will be a great weekend in Norfolk. And, for you know, on Saturday it was, right? It was. They got their revenge, big-time revenge. But on Friday, we own Friday. Yeah. So there will be no series sweep, no matter how it plays out. And yeah. uh, as we continue to to climb, those are the small victories for me. It's like avoiding the series sweep is big for me. You know, because it's A, avoid the series sweep, then B, win the series. That means you won one of three, and then you won two of three, and then series sweep, obviously. So there's ladders, or there's rungs on the ladder that we have to climb consistently. And being able to beat a power-hitting juggernaut like Old Dominion on the road is a big box for me to check with this baseball team. I am over the moon about that. I could care less that they gave up, you know, 21 the following day. The, The Friday night game was great to me. Well, we talk about this a lot, and we've talked about it on uh, both ways, that you can have carryover when Mm -hmm. someone is, you know, getting rolling and they can have several games like this. And then we've talked about other times where a 21 to 5 loss is the same as a 1 to nothing loss. It is. You lost. They don't put an asterisk beside it. They don't give you three losses for it. It's one loss. You move on to the next one. And you hope that those guys got it all out of their system in that game. <laughs> yeah. So you go on to, you know, say, hey, they came in thinking, you know, I'm going to hit the ball out of the yard because I hit three yesterday. Maybe they're over aggressive and you get a bunch of strikeouts. on. Yeah. You know, that's just a game of baseball. Um, it can happen to any individual game that you can win. So they play at one o'clock today uh, and we will hopefully see a, uh, a victory there and we'll come away with two series victories in our first two Sun Belt Conference series. Uh, if that happens and it happens against App State and Old Dominion I and neither of them playing in Huntington. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't care if the other one was at Charleston. It's not your home home yeah, place. You know what? I often wonder about how some of these dominant teams would do if they had to, if they were in that scenario. Like you never got a true home crowd. You never were in your, you know, your locker room. You know, well, you know taking I mean? a step further, you don't have an indoor hitting facility. You don't have yeah. all this stuff that we're that we're going to have when we have this new stadium. And I mean, it's just. But I'm just it, talking bare bones stuff. You know, some know. of these guys get to walk across campus, go to their facility and chill. And it's their yeah. home and they're there. Yeah. And we don't get that. 
you know, yeah, so you don't have a bus trip the, that you have to be on before the games. So yeah, doesn't matter if it's staying, 10, 12, 15 minutes up the road. It's still a bus staying, trip. Staying in a hotel and all yeah. that stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, it, it's uh, th- this program is going to grow by leaps and bounds, having the, the facilities that they're going to have starting next season. And uh, right now, for whatever that they're putting up for it in Greg Mills' first uh, first full season here, it's uh, it it it's good, you know, that they're they're building and building and building. And then next year, I really think we're going to take a leap forward. The the year after that, another, and so on. And we're going to yeah. be one of those teams that is going to be the team to beat in the Sun Belt. And I know Southern Miss right now is the team. I'm not saying that we're going to be above them. I'm going to say that we're also going to be one of those teams here in a couple of years that they will point to to say, you've got to play Marshall because when these facilities come, the good players and the the development is going to come with it. Yeah. Like some of these teams flirt with top 25 rankings and they're, they're, you know, you can't just come in and say, well, we get a stadium, we'll be a top 25 team. Right. I mean, you can't also not say that, but it's not a series that some of these teams will be able to look at and go that we don't worry. Let's look forward to, we've got a big matchup with Texas state coming, you know, yeah. let's, let's game plan. I don't think you'll be able to do that. It'll take a few years. I think we got the right guy in place, you know, um, and a couple more facilities, a few recruiting classes to, you know, start to where your third, fourth pitchers are also super quality guys. Like you might have a whole staff full of Patrick Copens. Right. And that's what you kind of got to have to be able to compete in this league. And then you go yeah. out and get some power hitting guys so that maybe Old Dominion doesn't have nine power hitters. They only have six and you have three of those guys. You know what I mean? So you start to mm-hmm. even the playing field a little bit. But hey, I don't care. I'll take whatever steps we can get right now because it's it's all pointing towards the positive. However you want to look at it with this program. Baseball also, when this series ends uh, after today. Oh, I left out one thing on that uh, Friday win. That was Greg Bills' 600th That's right. uh, uh, career win. So we definitely want to highlight that. Um, but they play at WVU boo, on Tuesday. <laughs> and then next weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they have a three-game series against <laughs> ULM at ULM. Okay. Let's uh, keep it with the diamond and close out as we are always going to do with softball. Yeah. Rolling. Can we, is that the, putting it lightly? <laughs> Rolling. All right. Uh, I want to highlight what we did and I'll let you get into all the stuff that you want to talk about with softball. Cause I know there's a lot of it. There is. Uh, we went to Louisville to play against UT Martin and Bellarmine on Wednesday of last week. We won four to one against UT Martin, Bellarmine 17 to two. And then uh, Friday's game got postponed because of the uh, torrential downpour that we had here. So we had a double header yesterday. We won four to nothing in the first game, 17 to nine in the second. And they are playing right now the third game of that series. We'll talk yep. a little bit about each game and then I'll tell you who we're playing after that. Yeah, I'm just going to hit the highlights, right? Because there's some things we talked about earlier in the show, Otomo and and Alex Coleman, and of course we've talked. We all know what uh, um, Sid Nestor has been doing, but there's other girls out there that are yep. doing things. You know, it's not just that. But you go back to UT Martin. You mentioned it's a four-one win. Owen uh, Otomo and has a home run in that one. Savannah Rice goes complete game with ten strikeouts in that one, and Alex Coleman, of course, picks up a stolen base against Bellarmine. We just come out and beat the brakes off of them. Um, Autumn Owen again takes one out of the yard, and Riley Riley Lucas joins the fray and takes one out of the yard as well. Both of them also add doubles in that game. Um, here's here's a cool stat from that. Nine stolen bases in that game against Bellarmine. Three by Alex Coleman. Uh, Grace and Bree Godfrey both get a couple, and Bub and uh, Riley Lucas get them one. Uh, Bree Godfrey ends up with the win in that one. Three and O oh on the season at that point. Five innings pitched with four Ks. Um, Bub comes in and pitches one inning, gives up no hits and strikes out one. But the kicker to that is, you know, Bree Godfrey was pitching with a lot of cushion, right? Run cushion. It was like an eight to one or whatever it was at eight to two at that point. <laughs> they take her out. And then the top of the inning, Marshall busts out for like nine runs. And then Bub comes in the pitch. You're like, 
well, there's no pressure here. You know what I mean? So her, her, her lone inning pitch is under the, under the tremendous run cushion of 15 <laughs> runs. That's got to feel good. You know, you can not be perfect and, and still come out of there with uh, relative ease. So then we moved to Southern Miss series, the first ever home Sunbelt Conference series at the dot. And I don't know if it would have been cooler to have a Friday, Saturday affair. I think the Saturday doubleheader set up pretty good. It allowed folks to turn out and catch a, a two for one type deal. And I think uh, we did that. If you go look at Dot Hicks Field seating capacity, it's listed at 325. OK, um, attendance for the first game, 671 attendance for the second game, 641. And of course, we talked about there was competing with volleyball and there was soccer. There was stuff going on. But still, um, double capacity for the opener for the first game and almost double capacity for the second one. Four to nothing was the first uh, win, first ever uh, Sunbelt Conference win at the dot. Cameron Michaelis goes first career home run. Huntington High School raise up. Huntington, West Virginia. She was so pumped. I hope you saw that replay. She was like feeling it because she took one out of the yard and it was awesome. Sid Nestor gets the dub in that one. 15 and two at that point. Complete game one hitter with 7K. Stop me if you've heard that before. 17 to nine was the second game. Home runs by Grace Chelleman, Bub Faringa, and Lauren Love. Sid Bickle has this. Great stand up infield double. When's the last time you saw that? Stand and then took, up then, infield then double. Took third on, on on them not covering the bag. That's right. I saw that coming a mile away. I don't know if if other people see that the way that I would see that, but being the connoisseur of base stealing, I see those opportunities, and and I'm glad she did too because it it makes for great highlights you're like well nobody's gonna catch me i'm swiping this one too and that was so awesome and man had, i'm telling you uh, sorry but me being there just to tell yeah. you uh on what what you uh saw cameron mahalas when uh when she hit that three run homer down the left field line the entire stadium got up uh from behind the bleachers because the outfield's packed you know right. behind the fence um but everyone on the on the behind home plate kind of deal, me, my kids, everybody included, we all hopped up to look down and <laughs> see if it was going to say fair or what. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, cause I mean, it, to me, it was a no doubter as soon as she hit it, it was, yeah. is it going to curve foul? Yeah. But everyone hopped up to see, to get a better view that was on the third base side and, uh, Stan, uh, who has Stan's visuals, does mm -hmm. all the videography and stuff was to my right. And he kept the camera on camera Mahalis, as she was going around, just such a great visual it and everything. Was. And uh, just sorry to hijack. I just wanted to tell you my in-person seeing that and how we just, it was a one nothing game at that point to where, yeah, Nestor's dominant as usual, but you're a, a walk, a bad uh, call, that sort of thing away from getting somebody on, on base and then a bloop or even knocking them around uh, with, with ground outs or something, getting someone on yeah. third and, and they score. So um, that was a huge, huge home run and uh, just set up for Nestor to mow him down in the, in the seventh to take the victory. It was just cool, man. I, I saw the tweet that they put out with the video and, and that feeling you could, you could just tell that it was like, it was the purest thing. She was yeah. so pumped to have that home run. Um, it just made me feel good to see uh, right the last few steps before she hit the plate. There was like one final like yell, um, uh, just one outpouring of emotion. And it was cool. It was just cool. So back to the uh, 17 to nine win. We had uh, three pitchers used in that game, which is not something that's commonplace for the herd. Uh, Savannah Rice. Pitched two innings. Bub pitched uh, an inning and a third, and they were just having some trouble. They were giving up some hits and runs, and and um, we made the move to Bree Godfrey, who pitched the final two and a third, and ended up getting the win. Let me tell you how how despite the score, seventeen to nine, Marshall as a team only had two strikeouts, like for, by our pitchers. So that tells you this is not your typical type of Marshall game. You know, we we generally tally quite a few of those throughout a, the course of a game. So this was another 
different type of victory. You know, we we had to um, bust out the bats more like we used to see last year. You're like, oh, you're kind of behind. You're in a little bit of a dog fight. We'll just, you know, pile some runs on and, and won't worry about it. And so it's nice to know that that's still kicking around in the arsenal if you need to use it. But it was just a different type of win. Just add that one to the types of ways this herd softball team wins. So now at the end of uh, yesterday's games, the herd was 26 and three, riding a 16 game win streak, undefeated at home and undefeated in Sunbelt Conference play. Um, and I will say this one's not over. The third game is not over, but currently Marshall is up four to nothing in the top of the sixth. Uh, Sid Nestor is still on the mound or in the circle. And she's kind of sort of a little bit cruising. She's not mowing them down. She's a five and a third innings pitch at this point, three hitter and seven Ks. But those Southern Miss bats have just been quiet. So I can't call this one a win because anything can happen. But uh, be pretty great to get a uh, first ever Sunbelt Conference home series sweep to start out the era. Softball girls are killing it. Killing yeah, I'm, I'm watching it as well. And uh, while you were giving the recap of these other games, uh, the Southern Miss leadoff hitter here in the sixth uh, had a bloop. Uh, that barely made it over to the shortstop. And then uh, next batter was a grounder to third base, and uh, Mahalis made an up uh, a heady play to get the lead runner in get second the lead, and yeah. everything. So he only got uh, one out, one on uh, first, 1-1 uh, one, one count. Make that are you, one are you watching count. video? I'm watching video. On oh, ESPN. no, I'm, ju- I'm just doing the, uh, the herd zone, like, game-by-game nope. game stats. No, so. I'm 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 in uh, 2023 over here watching uh, motion pictures. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm trying uh, to keep a stable connection <laughs> for a podcast over here. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, um, yeah. Uh, no matter what happens in this game, 16 uh, victories in a row uh, coming Bruising. into this game. Sid Nestor in the sixth inning still has not given up a run. I yeah. would like to see how many innings it has been that she has not given up a run. I don't know. RPI uh, but, my ass. We're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, what else can you say about these these girls, man? They, they're winning uh, with small ball, and they are winning with homers. I mean, Grace yep. Chellman is hitting homers. Uh, Riley Lucas is hitting homers. Autumn yep. is obviously hitting Crushing homers. Crushing it. Yeah, but, um, I mean, it's just – we're, we're firing on all cylinders right now. I yeah. didn't get to watch that second game because I was at the volleyball game, and I saw that we had three errors in that game. Southern Miss had five, by the way. Mm-hmm. But that is so uncharacteristic to see errors now. And last year, that was something that hurt us. You know, we were the big boppers hitting all these home runs, but then we had runners on base that shouldn't have been on base because, you know, errors. And mm-hmm. – it seems like we have just such a lockdown defense this year that it is so uncharacteristic to see one error, much less three in a game. And there were some tremendous defensive plays in that game that I was at for the four nothing victory. Yeah. I remember seeing something. uh, I think it was Alex Coleman had a diving catch to start one of those games, or maybe it was today's game. I don't know. Uh, And I think, you know, look, let me put it in terms like we've talked about basketball before. All right. We talked about bringing in Kerfman and allowing everybody to kind of move back to where they go. And I'm not saying that that's kind of what we've done, but the addition of Sid Bickle at shortstop Mm -hmm. has brought such a presence defensively that it's taken a load off of a lot of those surrounding positions that are on her side of the field. And it's just been so important to what we've been able to do. She's just such a really good player, man. I don't know how we were able to lure her to come to play in Huntington, but man, I'm glad she's here because heads up runs, you know, these, these uh, snagging, remember she snagged the line drive a couple uh, games ago that preserved some or kept some runs off yeah. the board. It's just play after play after play. She's just a really good player. And she gets, um, I don't say, I won't say underappreciated, but she's just not getting the amount of credit that she's due because of the utter dominance of other categories, the home runs, the pitching, you know, the stolen bases and stuff. But she's just like the probably one of the best, if not maybe the best all around offensive slash defensive player that we may have. She's yeah, just she, that good. She, she's so smooth at short. Yeah, and, very you know, smooth, it, very fluid. It, it, anyone that has played the game. Uh, can appreciate you know a good defensive player when they see it by their footwork uh by you know just all the little things like that they don't uh 
field the ball on the ground and then raise up and then throw that it's kind of a fluid motion mm-hmm. and and how they do it and they stay low when they do that she does all those things ticks all the right boxes on what you should do as a short stop and uh it it helps tremendously yeah. of course it and doesn't hurt that you have a head coach that specializes in defensive corner corner, <laughs> corner yeah. defense. but uh oh sid got uh two strikeouts to end the inning just now by the way so uh we are heading into the bottom of the six up four nothing there you go man rolling where are they going next we didn't even talk about where we're going next where well i wanted i wanted to wait until we talked about each of those games and then talk so after today's game um they are hosting northern kentucky on tuesday so if you're here and able to in the afternoon uh early afternoon go over to dot hit hicks field watch this amazing team uh it's a it's a fun time uh it's energetic lots of fans are going to be there um then we host georgia state for a three-game series this weekend so okay four chances tuesday friday saturday and sunday to come over and see this tremendous team that man i mean if they win today if they hold on to win today they're going to be 27 and 3 27 and 3 yep. that's a 900 winning percentage yeah and then they've got four games here in a row before they hit next week's schedule so they could be 31 and 3 going into wherever they're heading to after that i mean yeah we're getting into um april next weekend so that means we're drawing ever closer to green and white game weekend, which is a big softball weekend with James Madison coming. We're going to continue to talk about that every week because Alabama's that weekend or week as well. Okay. So we're, but I mean that particular weekend, we're making a big deal about that weekend and we want people to continue like circle it, circle the Sunday game. If you can come to one, you know, you're going to, you're going to be in town probably for the green and white game for Saturday. Make sure you come back or at least come out for the softball game on Sunday because we're going to do something really cool there. We're having a tailgate and it's going to be a big deal. I think it's even alumni weekend for the softball. So alumni uh, for baseball. I think it's softball too. I thought I, when I was talking with uh, the person, the, yeah, yeah, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but right. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think I thought she mentioned that too. So I don't know. I have to go back and check on that, but it may be. I, I can tell you that it's definitely that Friday is alumni baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, banquet and meeting and then they're going up to watch the game on route two at home and and everything saturday uh, will definitely be the green and white game we're going to be tailgating early for that and then the next day against james madison which james madison's friday saturday and sunday right. that sunday game is at noon against right. james madison so uh big weekend we uh we got picked up four sponsors for that nice. and we'll nice. be talking uh talking about that but thanks to those sponsors we're going to be bringing you some amazing food and thanks to uh cal and chris who will be coming down and cooking on the their smokers uh that food that is purchased by those four sponsors is going to be some of the best food you've ever eaten yep make your plans circle it on the calendar do whatever the hell you got to do just make your way out there and enjoy some of the festivities it's going to be a great freaking time russ you got anything else if not take us out of here Yeah, so whether you see us at the Joan, whether you see us at the Dot, whether you see us at the Cam, or whether you see us over there at the Green and White Game stuffing our faces with as many burn-ins as we can put in there, no matter where you see us, we're going to be saying, go Herd. Go Herd. It's the Thundercast. We'll see you next week. Later.